9. Words mean what you want them to mean. It is very confusing when people use different words for the same thing. In England we say lift for what the Americans call elevator, property when they say real estate, and petrol when they say gas. But even greater misunderstandings arise when people use the same word for different things. The American woman carries a handbag which she sometimes calls her purse, while an English woman carries a handbag in which she has a much smaller purse for her money. The American woman carries her money in her wallet. As we saw in Chapter 3, sugar sometimes means the beautiful white powder or lumps that this book is all about, sucrose. But sometimes it means a different substance that circulates in the blood. Glucose. Another example is the word energy, which, as I shall discuss, means one thing to the non scientist and quite another to the nutritionist. Glucose is a sugar that is found, usually with other sugars, in some fruits and vegetables. It is very important to biochemists, physiologists, and nutritionists because it is a key material in the metabolism of all plants and animals. Many of our principal foods are sooner or later converted into glucose, and glucose forms one of the most important substances that is metabolized or oxidized or burned in the tissues to supply energy for everyday activities. Where Energy Comes From Almost every book written by people in or associated with the sugar industry contains a section in which you are told how important sugar is because it is an essential component of the body. They tell you that it is oxidized so as to give energy, that it is a key material in all sorts of metabolic processes, and so on. And they imply, or even say explicitly, that all this is to do with sugar, sucrose, whereas in fact they have been talking about blood sugar, glucose. The fact is that sucrose and glucose have different chemical structures, and their effects in the body differ in important ways. When the word sugar is used at one moment to mean the sucrose in your food, and at another to mean the glucose in your blood, these differences are hidden. So accustomed do we then become to this blurring of definitions, that eventually we find it difficult to accept the vital differences between the sucrose we eat and the glucose in our blood. There is a second way in which you may be led to believe that sugar is an important, if not essential, item of our diet. Here is a quotation from a pamphlet from the sugar industry. Sugar works for you with each bite you eat, for your body is an energy factory with sugar as its fuel. Firstly, it is not sugar, sucrose, but sugar, glucose, that is the body's fuel. And secondly, what does energy really mean? When you say, I have no energy, or little Johnny is full of energy, you use the word to mean either physical activity or the inclination to be physically active. When you say that Johnny is full of energy, you picture him rushing around, leaping up and down stairs, climbing a tree, or tearing along on his bicycle. On the other hand, when you say you have no energy, you imply that you do not want to do anything much other than sit about, or preferably lie down. So when someone says, sugar gives you energy, you imagine this is just what you need to leap out of your chair and dash around like little Johnny. But the physiologist and the nutritionist who talk about sugar and energy mean something different. What they mean is that sugar, like any other food after having been digested and absorbed, can be utilized by the body so as to release the energy you need for all the functions of the body. These include such automatic activities as breathing, heartbeat, or digestion, and all the chemical reactions of the living body that add up to what is called metabolism. They also include such voluntary activities as dressing or walking or running. What people really mean when they say that sugar gives them energy 
is simply that it is a potential source of the energy needed for the processes of living. It is there when you need it, in the same sort of way as the petrol or gas that you put into your car is in the tank, ready to be burned when you want the car engine to go. Just putting another gallon or two in the tank does not, of itself, make the car go any faster or make it any more energetic. And taking another spoonful of sugar does not, of itself, make you jump out of your chair and rush to mow the lawn. All food, then, contains energy, in that some of its components can provide the fuel for the body's workings. Normally you have quite a sizable reserve of this fuel in your tissues, stored from the food you have eaten on previous occasions. If you were starving so that you had little or none of this reserve, and in addition, if it were imperative that you have some fuel in your tissues within minutes in addition to the glucose in your blood, then it might be a good idea to eat sugar rather than any other food, because the sugar quickly gets digested and absorbed and taken to the tissues. A piece of bread and butter would take a few minutes longer. This insignificant time differential is what the sugar propagandists mean when they talk about sugar's quick energy. But isn't it really quite rare for circumstances to arise that make it imperative for you to take advantage of this more rapid availability of energy from sugar? And besides, as we shall see later, it may be that the rapidity with which sugar floods the bloodstream is harmful rather than beneficial. I sometimes wonder whether the insistence that sugar contains energy arises from the fact that it contains nothing else. All other foods contain energy as well as at least some nutrients in the way of protein or minerals or vitamins or a mixture of these. Sugar contains energy and that is all. Pure is good. As I have shown, the combination of all foods contains the whole range of essential materials that the body needs for its survival and well-being. Each one of these is derived from living plants or living animals. If they are not processed in any way, they contain a mixture of approximately 50 essential materials. From a cabbage you obtain, among other essentials, some vitamin A and vitamin C and calcium. From a piece of meat you obtain protein, fat, several vitamins of the B group, iron, and many other nutrients. But suppose one were to cultivate pine trees instead of cabbages, and then extract the vitamin C and eat that instead of eating cabbage. It would be possible now to claim that you have consumed absolutely pure vitamin C, but it would not be of any particular advantage to get it this way rather than from the cabbage. In fact, you would lose out in this transaction, because the cabbage would have given you other nutritional benefits apart from vitamin C. Yet this is really the sort of thing people do when they make sugar. They plant vast areas of land with sugar cane or sugar beet instead of crops that they can eat more or less whole. Then they take the cane or beet and extract, clean, filter, refine and purify it until they have something that is virtually a 100% sugar. At this point, the refiners say with absolute truth that this sugar is one of the purest foods known. Once more, a word is being used in two different senses. When you say water is pure, or bread or butter, you mean that it is not contaminated with anything inferior, and especially not contaminated with anything harmful. But then you are persuaded to carry over this sense of wholesomeness to the chemist's meaning, a material that does not have something else mixed with it, irrespective of whether this something would have been harmful or harmless or even beneficial. There is no special reason to praise sugar for the fact that, in the course of its elaborate preparation, it is freed from all other materials so that it is chemically pure, as are most of the other materials the chemist has on his laboratory shelves. Equally, I would see no reason for being pleased at being presented with pure protein for my consumption, 
or pure vitamin B12 or any other dietary component in its isolated state. What virtue would this represent?